Yeah, baby, that's 32nd Lover, Steve Winwood. Steve Cropper's new uh, dedicated album. Not even out yet. You're getting the first listen uh, to this uh, to this music. Steve Cropper, the legendary guitarist. He, he hates the word legend because it makes you sound old. But uh, yeah, Steve Cropper in studio <laughs> with us today. Long time friend. Man, great to get you back in Good studio and catch again. up. And, I hear you all the time. Don't get to look at you all the time. Yeah, you know, that's one of the great advantages of, of broadcasting from Nashville Music City. You know, you have folks that are trying to track down the Steve Croppers and, you know, the Trace Adkins and the John Riches to get them on their radio shows. It's like, I don't need to get them on my shows. They're listening and half the time they're calling in. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> now, you just got back from France. You guys are, are getting ready to go on the road uh, with this uh, with this new album and, and and tell us how did this whole thing come about by the way uh by the way let me set the stage well, folks that are going <laughs> steve cropper uh if you're talking about uh sitting on the dock of the bay midnight sun the blues brothers in the in the old sam and dave classic where they're playing soul man and they go play it steve that would be steve cropper doing the guitar riff right. they did that in the blues brothers but I, but I recently legally got dated green onions is a commercial for depends Oh man! That, <laughs> now that's gotta hurt. Something. That hurts. <laughs> First words out of my mouth was, "Do we get free boxes of it?" <laughs> and just think, thirty years ago, you wouldn't have cared that you wouldn't, was, you wouldn't have wanted that. product as part of it. Anyway, Steve Cropper, one of the true legends. Uh, Stacks Records, uh, Booker T, and the MGs. If you if none of these mean anything to you, it means you're under age fifty or under age twenty, probably because Maybe. there's a new generation of fans of this this era of music. Absolutely. These young minds are, are wanting to go back, and so basically the whole concept of this album is just to kind of re-educate the young minds, the new generation, to where, where music came from and why we all do what we do. And it fits right in with all of their their uh, fans uh, of the of their artists that they love today. All that music came from somewhere, and they need to know where it came from. And so this is just one you know example of it. Yeah, you know, the buying power of the baby boom generation, that fifty to sixty five yeah. year old. All of age these group. songs on this album were written prior to nineteen fifty eight, which that dates it pretty good. Now we've given it a modern twist, of course, and brought it brought it to life. And this is the kind of music that I grew up on when I was in high school. And, and the kind of music that again we're starting to see in ads, not just for Depends, but you know, in car ads and everything else, you know, they're going back and saying, "Hey, this is the music that connects to that still powerful baby boom spender." Absolutely, and and that music makes the connection. Well, we all know that uh, you know how big the '60s were and how influential American music was in the '60s and what it brought forth. Uh, most of those artists, can't say all of them, but most of those artists that were successful were listening to this music, to these songs by the Five Royals. What makes it withstand the test of time? I mean, why is it that that these riffs, this rhythm, th- these words? Why, why do these well, songs withstand obviously the test it's, of time? it's it's the energy uh, of course and it's the original intention I, I always said about stacks people ask me all the time well why was stacks so successful and I said because we had a great team just like a great basketball team and as you all know any any sports fans know that money isn't everything you can buy the absolute greatest players on the planet that have the best stats and they're still not come out and be the winners at the end of the year it's that team that puts their heart and soul into it and all are there for the for the same purpose of you know coming out with the same result and that's to win and uh, that's why it was so successful and i think this music has just lived through that because the writers had that intention when they wrote it my sense is that that you had that unique blend of chemistry and competitiveness because you'd be in the studio and everybody was 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 loving what they were doing making the music but they were also wanting to compete and say, look, I can outdo you. And that yeah. competitiveness combined with the chemistry is what creates the magic. Absolutely. And uh, there were so many uh, cities that had the Battle of the Bands and, you know, amateur night every Friday night and whatever. And every kid that was on that show was wanting to be number one at the end of the evening. And so it's very competitive. You're still touring like crazy. You're getting ready to go. Yeah, in quite In Europe a bit. especially. <laughs> And I know when you're when you're looking at the audience again worldwide, this is music that that is American music. It is Americana. But as you're looking at the audience, you're seeing folks our age, but you're also seeing all these youngsters that are that are really hearing this music for the first time yeah, and, it's, and it's sharing with their friends. Wait till now. you hear this. <laughs> <laughs> we just had uh, Saturday night in uh, outside of Paris. We had about twenty, a little over twenty thousand people playing nothing but Blues Brothers and Stax music. So. Talk a little bit about the whole Blues Brothers business because you know, oh, I mean, well. how many lines? I was I was talking with friends yesterday, and it's like you know whether it's the you know we're 136 miles from Chicago, you know it's dark, you know we're on a mission from God, we're wearing sunglasses. I mean, it's it's one of those movies that people I know throw lines at you all the time. Oh yeah, it was unbelievable. And one of the things that uh, Belushi and Ackroyd both said, we're not going to make you guys rich, but we'll keep you laughing, and that's true. It never stopped. It was just the most fun you could possibly have. It was a crazy funny script. If you just read 
admitted it was funny, and to see Belushi act it out was even funnier. I mean, it, they had to make us stop laughing so they could get serious about shooting certain scenes. It, it was amazing. We had more fun making that movie than anything I've ever done, and we all said the same thing. And again, folks, I know throw lines at you all the time. They do, and and what is amazing to me is when somebody comes up and says, you know, I saw your movie, I saw the Blues Brothers. If they're saying it for the first time, they say it's one of the funniest movies I've ever seen, or they may say, you know, I've watched that movie a hundred times and I never get tired of seeing it. So that it really means something when they say that. Talk a little bit about this this album, Dedicated. I mean, you, you were able to pull in some folks like like Winwood. We heard 30 Second Lover. Uh, you you pulled people in that, that other people can't get to come into an album and do this stuff in the well, studio. Well, we're very fortunate to have that. And uh, basically, that was the whole concept. Uh, not the whole concept, but the whole idea was John Tiven's idea to co-produce the record. And uh, he was the one initially said, we need to get some of your friends to be on this album. And I'm one of these guys, and I'm not a very good uh, Girl Scout cookie salesman. I just cannot go door to door and ask anybody for anything. I'm just not that kind of guy. I do it myself. So he said, well, let me make the call. So he started making the calls, and nobody turned him down. It was amazing. It was like 100%. Who were you most surprised that came on board? Uh, well, I, I, it just kept happening, so I really wasn't surprised. I'm very fortunate to have a lot of people. Um, uh, somebody that I thought I could get uh, that we got was B.B. King. And he just said right away, but he said, there's a song I want to do. And so he picked out the song he wanted to do. A lot of them did. And the neat thing about making this record, we cut the record here in Nashville. Uh, We cut all uh, 16 tracks. I think there's 15 on this album. There's there's one bonus track that you can get on YouTube or something or iTunes. But anyway, um, we cut uh, 16 tracks in two days. And about four of the artists said, can I be there on the tracking date? They wanted to sing live with the band. Now, you never get that request anymore. That was pretty important. Yeah, you get a lot of fans that say, I want to be with the band, but not the actual the entertainer say, I want to be there when we uh, when we put this right. thing together. And Steve, Steve Winwood didn't have time to do it while he was here, and uh, he promised me, uh, Gina sent me an email and said that Steve will try to tackle your song when we get back from our skiing trip, and I thought that was pretty cool. So. Now, we're going to go out uh, in this segment with uh, Little Baby Don't Do It, B.B. King. Now, again, this one is what B.B. said, this is the one I want to do. Right. Well, we'll listen to it as we come out. Steve Cropper, Shamika Copeland uh, with him, and B.B. King, again, one of the giants, one of the legends. The uh, the new album, dedicated. Steve Winwood, Lucinda Williams, B.B. King. Man, they're all on it. And uh, we're going to talk about the fact that that Steve brought in an actual album. like One of the giant black CDs. You don't see them anymore. They came out with those with this, too. Just as, again, a tribute to the music when the music was music. And uh, we're back with more Steve Cropper on the Steve Gill Show in just a moment.